going to mug me. I'm not going to mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veely now. If you want to know all about Andy Warhol, just look at the surface of my paintings and films and me. And there I am. There's nothing behind it. Andy Warhol, an artist who, his entire life, provocatively asserted that he only existed on the surface, that he was just a personality devoid of history and emotions. Hiding behind half-truths and genuine lies, Andy Warhol chose to wear a mask all his life. Warhol's personality? He never gave anything away. It's important to realize that. He hid behind fakery. You had to force the secret out of him. There is always an interplay between the simplicity of a painting, an utterance or an image, and something far more complex, which you discover little by little. The whole world knows his famous paintings of Campbell's soup tins and the multiple portraits of Marilyn Monroe. His face is his signature, and it has made him a star. He is one of the most famous artists of the 20th century. And yet, very few people know the man hidden behind the artist. If we go back to the childhood of the man then known as Andrew Wahola, we discover a complex being, influenced by family traditions, popular culture and religion. I don't think it comes down to one piece of art. If he wasn't religious, I just think that a, a greater part of the theme of his art would be different. It's important to understand the cultural practice of religion. Warhol's true origins are to be found there. From these miscellaneous influences, which were so deeply rooted in him, he fashioned a unique world, an artistic and philosophic world, but also a cold one. His work is disturbing in its simplicity, and it's in direct confrontation with the upheaval of his time. Andre Warhola, Andy Warhol's father, settled in Pittsburgh in 1912. He was joined several years later by his wife, Julia, newly arrived from her native Slovakia. They came here to find work, lured by the promise of this land of freedom. Pittsburgh was the capital of the coal and steel industry, and its chimneys formed an imposing industrial landscape. This urban environment was frighteningly modern. The city was constantly expanding and became the symbol of a country destined to build the new century. Pittsburgh was known for a very industrial city. Uh, steel was very big here in Pittsburgh. Steel mills, they, they run every day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, 365 days a, a year. They don't shut down at all. 
And you can see it's very visible. There's flames coming out, there's smoke. Pittsburgh was a city of opposites. On the one hand, you had the Fricks, the Mellons, and the Carnegies, the rich families who built these American cities, and on the other, all the workers. Where Uncle Andy lived was mainly a lot of immigrant workers who came over, so that would be the poor side of town. But the crash in 1929 brought the machines to a standstill, and one by one, the factories closed down. The youngest Warhola, Andrew, was only one year old, so his father, Andre, took any job he could get. In the coal mines, in the steelworks, on building sites, he worked non-stop, relentlessly. Andre was a hard worker. He was often away from home, uh, and uh, sometimes he would even have to travel, and he wouldn't be home for days on end. But uh, it, it was just uh, his way. He was a workaholic. When he came home, he was exhausted, you know, and, and he would just go to sleep, eat, go to sleep, and get up and do it all over again. And it was mainly just, you know, to support the family and to survive. You know, my grandfather didn't have hobbies. He didn't golf or he didn't do any. His hobby was his family. Andy's parents responded to poverty by seeking solace in spirituality, by observing their religious traditions. Every Sunday, this little boy would accompany his parents and his two big brothers through the soulless streets of the city. Come rain or snow, they walked the 10 kilometers to church. The Byzantine Catholic Church of St. John Chrysostom. My grandmother was very religious and she required that everybody in the family go to church and, uh, you know, say their prayers. Uh, the, the religious, uh, you know, segment of Catholicism, it's called the Byzantine Catholic. An incongruous island in the midst of a sea of grayness, this church in Pittsburgh was etched on little Andy's imagination. walk into the church and you're totally stimulated. Your eyes are stimulated by all the beautiful, wonderful icons, by the gold screens, the dome, the stained glass windows. There was a very beautiful Byzantine Catholic Rusin chant that the, the parishioners would sing and again, very pleasing to the ears, as well as the use of incense. It's based off of sort of the premise of heaven on earth. So when you walk into the church, you're surrounded by beauty and this beautiful scent and this beautiful chant. Andy was fascinated by these pious images. Opposite him, above the altar, was a painting of Jesus and his disciples at the Last Supper. I like to joke around where Uncle Andy was maybe sitting in church as a little boy and seeing maybe an icon of Jesus and thinking, boy, that would really be neat if we could put Marilyn or Shirley Temple up there. 30 years later, Andrew Warhola, who had become Andy Warhol, painted his most famous painting, Gold Marilyn Monroe, based on these religious icons. In it, the actress is immortalized as a saint on a gold background, her features simplified by blocks of color. In 1934, 
Andy's father, Andre, finally found a permanent job. The Warholers' situation improved, and they moved into this house, a stone's throw from their church. This house became a bubble for Andy, protecting him from the outside world. Andy was an odd child, very different from his two older brothers, who were more robust and played football. He was born with a delicate constitution and was soon afflicted by a nervous condition known as St. Vitus dance. People suffering from this condition cannot control their movements or speech. This illness kept him off school for quite a long time, tied to his mother's apron strings. He was delighted and spent his days drawing. It was mostly Julia, my grandmother, who took care of Andy, and she's the one that was really instrumental in showing him how to draw. I think that's where it all started. You know, I always say that she was probably his biggest influence because she had a very unique artistic way about herself. She had this magical quality. He would use a soup can and use paper mache to make flowers, and then she would sell those door to door. She would go into more some of the more richer neighborhoods. She was musical. She was artistic. She decorated eggs. She, she uh, did a lot of uh, sewing. So uh, I think her her talent rubbed off on Andy in a big way. Andrew Warhola was installed in the center of the living room. He was treated like a king, the privilege of the seriously ill. This illness kept him away from other teenagers, stopped him going out with friends, having his first sexual encounters, his first love affairs. He was isolated from all that. From a very early age, he got into the habit of observing. His childhood was one of hardship and illness. He was a sickly child. He was teased at school. He was a mummy's boy and privileged too. His mother Molly coddled him, and so he suffered from terrible shyness, which he had to learn to overcome. Warhol really was extremely secretive. He wore a mask so that no one would know who he was. There was doubtless a link between this decisive childhood episode and his distant relationship with things. It was as if he was looking at life through a glass window. Besides his home life, Andy only had one form of escapism from the disturbing reality, the cinema. In the 1930s, Hollywood was experiencing a golden age. As the economic crisis dragged on, Americans hid en masse in darkened rooms. By the age of seven, Andrew was a regular cinema-goer. 
passionné pour le cinéma, mais... He was passionate about the cinema, but that was normal in the 1930s, when the big studios were in their heyday. He was fascinated by America's sweetheart, Shirley Temple. He wrote her a note, and by some miracle, he received a reply from Shirley Temple, which he showed to everyone. He was jumping for joy. He was a true fan, obsessed with this little girl, this child star who had been fashioned by the studios and appeared in all the most popular films. For the children of that generation, the cinema provided a window onto the outside world. In that sense, Hollywood had the ability to fire up people's imaginations in a way that we don't really understand today. Dont on n'a sans doute pas une idée très claire aujourd'hui. Et c'est évidemment pour n'importe quel adolescent. Obviously, for any teenager in Andy's position, the vision of another world and of things he had never imagined possible suddenly appearing on screen was quite magical. Andy's parents realized he would not have the same future as his two brothers who were already in work. Despite their modest salaries, they managed, thanks to a bursary, to enroll him in drawing classes. Andre, he doesn't come from an elite class. He's not very, you know, educated in art, but he knew there was something special about Uncle Andy. Um, and he knew that, you know, that it was worth to save as much money as he possibly could to ensure that Uncle Andy would go to college. And even to go further and to make that prediction that you're gonna be proud of Andy someday. Andre didn't live to see his son's success. In 1942, he died suddenly, poisoned by contaminated water on a building site. And he was 14. Deeply affected and incapable of confronting his father's death, he refused to go to the funeral. Three years later, he did his father proud and got into Carnegie Tech University. There he did courses in applied arts, design and graphics. But soon Andy was drawing attention to himself and caused his first scandal with this painting. A self-portrait which he called, The broad gave me a face, but I can pick my own nose. His teachers were divided. He was very close to getting thrown out. But Andrew applied himself, and in 1949, he finally got his diploma. Age 21, despite being anxious about leaving his mother, he realized that if he wanted to live off his art, he had to move. He headed for the new capital of art and the avant-garde, New York. Thanks to steel from Pittsburgh, the city had the world's biggest skyscrapers, such as the Empire State Building. Charlie Parker and Miles Davis played in the city's jazz clubs. And Jackson Pollock, with his abstract expressionism, ruled the contemporary art world. It was also the birthplace of beat generation writers such as Jack Kerouac and William Burroughs. On Times Square, Andy stood outside flashy cinema facades where the big stars were on screen. Marilyn Monroe, Elizabeth Taylor, and Marlon Brando. With only $200 in his pocket, Warhol moved to Manhattan. He lived in a small studio flat with a friend who was to become a great painter, Philip Palstein. The two men experienced a brief period of bohemianism while living as artists in New York. They moved from flat share to flat share in a downtown that was not at all like it is today. All the neighborhoods in Lower Manhattan were seedy, flea-ridden and full of cockroaches. They were teeming with young people trying their luck, but not all of them would succeed. 
tout le monde ne va pas réussir. Il va courir les euh, rédactions de magazines de mode avec un carton. And he trawled round fashion magazine editing houses with a cardboard box full of drawings. Everyone was instantly seduced by his stylishness and boyish charm. He seduced the female editors of Vogue and Harper's Bazaar and other leading fashion magazines, such as Glamour, which commissioned him to produce a series of drawings. He had struck lucky. As soon as he arrived, Andy got a commission from Glamour magazine for a series of articles entitled What is Success? He delivered sketches of rather whimsical women. His drawings caused a sensation and advertising contracts followed. The swankiest shops in New York called on him to dress their windows. It was around this time that he dropped the last letter of his name and started signing his work Andy Warhol a much more American name. He became a successful young graphic designer. Then one day, out of the blue, his mother Julia turned up at his apartment. She came in, in approximately 1952. It was two years after he arrived in New York. She was determined that she would take care of Andy and live with him, and he was okay with that. For the next almost 20 years, she was there in New York uh, doing all his housework and taking care of him at home, and I think she was an important uh, support for him all through those years, uh, and I think that they gave him a kind of a security that, that no one else could give him. In the mornings, Uncle Andy and, and my grandmother, who I affectionately referred to as Bubba, um, Uncle Andy and Bubba would kneel down and say a prayer before he left. If you say a prayer, it's a dangerous world out there, and you know you, you ask for God's protection so that you could come home. She had this really very interesting handwriting, uh, which was actually just the handwriting that everybody in the region where she came from, they all learned this type of handwriting. This was the standard. To people in New York, it was very odd and strange and kind of fun, and it didn't really fit anything that they knew. It was just so foreign. And all the art directors, they loved this. You know, the, the, all of his clients loved it. And pretty soon she was doing entire pieces under Warhol's name. And she actually won two uh, professional graphic design awards in New York. Throughout the 50s, Andy Warhol's work went hand in hand with the dawn of the consumer society. With a string of prizes to his name and admired by his peers, he was now a rich man. Born poor to immigrant parents, he had turned his life around. In 1960, he bought this four-story house in the city's poshest neighborhood, Upper East Side, near Central Park. As always, his mother followed him and moved into the ground floor. Andy started painting. He had made his fortune so he could afford to do his own work and turn down advertising commissions. He was making work for himself, trying out new things. At that time, his nephews regularly made the trip from Pittsburgh to see him. Some years later, James Warhola, who had become an illustrator, drew this comic strip based on childhood memories and visits to see his uncle. And of his discovery of Andy Warhol's very first works. It was just a wonderful space uh, for kids. And a lot of our memories are when we visit him in New York at this townhouse. 
We remember when he was doing his first soup cans, he's doing these simple images of soup cans. They almost look like advertising art. They didn't look like fine art, but he did them well. So he was hand painting all these images and uh, we knew it took quite a talent and uh, we loved watching him do it. He would start working probably around 10 o'clock. He'd be busy all through the day painting. Uh, he'd be listening to music. At one point, he, he realized my brother and I were really good workers, so he, he put us to work stretching canvases. So we were thrilled to help him stretch canvases uh, at home. He was very uh, exact on how he liked his canvases uh, without any wrinkles, and we were able to do it. So when I was seven and my brother was nine, we were, we were doing that kind of work. That's when he was doing the, the paint-by-number paintings or the dance step paintings the dollar bills. Uh, we stretched all those early paintings uh, and uh, it was pretty thrilling. The paintings started piling up in the small house. And he condensed all his influences in his paintings. They contained everything that had shaped his lucid vision of the era. The dollar sign, and the Campbell's soup can were almost like religious icons of everyday life. My mother, um, she was very direct with my uncle. I know that uh, she didn't think uh, any of it was art, so she didn't really take it too seriously, and she'd tell him, and, and I actually ask him, why didn't he get rid of all this stuff at home that was kind of uh, his art? And he always told her it was really important that someday it was going to be worth a lot of money. That was one of my uncle's kind of principles, that, that anything could be art. It doesn't matter what type of subject or what your medium is, anything could be art. I think that was an important principle, and I think that's what he based his early pop art paintings on. In 1962, he discovered a printing technique which allowed him to reproduce his works ad infinitum on canvas, screen printing. It was a provocative way of turning creativity into production. The traditional art world may have found it shocking, but it opened doors in some urbane and decadent circles. That's when he met Emile De Antonio, an artist agent famous for his intuition. That marked a turning point in Warhol's career as an artist. Warhol travaille d'arrache-pied et un jour présente deux Warhol had been working non-stop. One day he presented two paintings to Emile de Antonio, who was famous in the art world for being a consultant with a nose for quality. Warhol showed him a painting of a bottle of Coca-Cola painted in an expressive lyrical style with a lot of feeling. It contained trickles and gestures. It was about painting and paint. Then he showed him another painting of a bottle of Coca-Cola with no trickles and no gestures. And Emile de Antonio said to him, that's it, you must plough that furrow, that direct identification with the model without commentary. Pop art speaks for itself. His suggestion was to set up a production line, to focus on quantity, to mass reproduce a single image. What would it mean to be swamped by images? The more you look at something, the less meaningful it becomes. In 1962, the critics got carried away. The Campbell soup can paintings were even nicknamed the Mona Lisa of the modern age. Warhol understood that pop art was factual art, the art of the present. His work made radical claims that consumerism and showbiz were the new religions of the 20th century. To get rid of his mannered, gestural approach, he had to brainwash himself. Il fallait qu'il se desservelle. Or at least for... But this on himself, I'd feel on safer ground than you. Whatever you say.
Il fallait qu'il se mette hors de lui, c'est-à-dire hors de sa sensibilité. He basically had to distance himself from his feelings and become a machine. De Warhol. This was not a marketing project or a pose. It was a real artistic objective to invent a form. At the end of 1962, American pop art was born. As proof of his meteoric rise to fame, almost all of Warhol's works found buyers at this one-man show at the Stable Gallery, one of the best-known galleries in New York. Obsessed with the mass media, Warhol compulsively read and collected all the newspapers he could find. On the 4th of June, 1962, he came across a front page announcing the death of 129 people in a plane crash. With caustic irony, he painted a huge picture of it over two meters square, reappropriating the paper's morbid images. For Warhol, who had witnessed the wide-scale expansion of the media, it was clear that this exploitation of death had something about it that was both unbearable and crucial. This image was revealing of a new form of society that thought nothing of exploiting death in this brutal way. That was one of the salient features of the world he now found himself in. Just like Marilyn's ethereal beauty, the two go hand in hand. Remember that he decided to paint Marilyn on the day he learned of her suicide. NBC Radio, News on the Hour, brought to you by the Metropolitan Life and... Celebrities' sudden deaths, car crashes, racist attacks. Andy Warhol's art is anything but inoffensive. Painting is commemorative for Warhol. It commemorates that which has disappeared forever. It is a way of keeping and preserving an image of what has been lost. The pathos of these car crashes is all the greater when the images show people we don't know. They are images of strangers, but they show the extent to which images of dead people are a key issue. Not just from a socio-philosophical point of view, but also from an aesthetic point of view. This series shows the electric chair in Sing Sing prison. It is an empty, brutal throne. The violent symbol of a society where death and showbiz are intertwined. The house in Lexington had become too small for Warhol. He needed work assistance, and he had to find somewhere to store his mass productions. Meeting Gérard Malanga was useful. He was a student, a young poet, with a flamboyant mane of brown hair. In January 1964, they invested in a disused factory, which they covered in aluminium and silver paint. The mythical factory was born. It was a factory, it was a hat factory. But when we saw the, the space, it was empty, it was dark, it was you know, gloomy, it was not a very enthusiastic space, but uh, Andy saw something, the possibilities. And, so we had to sign a lease and then we moved into the space. It had a lift like the ones you used to get in old lofts. The lift door opened straight onto the loft. There was no front door or anything. Atelier. Uh, Warhol had the factory. He loved surrounding himself with crazy people, people who took drugs and cross-dressed. Warhol really liked strange people. I think he, he liked people in general. I think he was he really studied, you know, personalities, and he liked 
having a lot of different people. And it was this idea of like mixing really amazing people from high society and low society and maybe kind of creating some frictions, see what happens. The factory was a place to hang out in and meet people. It was a place of spontaneous experimentation. Very soon, a modern hybrid lifestyle developed there. Work, artificial paradises, and all-night parties all merged into one. Andy Warhol created his own superstars there. These men, women, and transvestites were models and muses, fashioned in the image of the Hollywood dream factory of his childhood. The place acted as a magnet for fashionable New Yorkers. Andy Warhol always remained slightly aloof. He was both at the center of things and in the background, a voyeur. People thought that everyone was hanging around me at the factory, but it was the opposite. I was hanging around them. We didn't really know what was going on at the factory. And at the same time, he didn't really bring too many people home from the factory. So he kind of, he liked it that way, I think, because uh, at home he had his privacy, uh, a certain amount of peacefulness, and, um, and especially his mother who took care of him. Uh, I think that was really important for him to grow as an artist. In 1965, out of the blue, Andy Warhol announced that he was going to stop painting and focus on filmmaking. I remember at that time in the mid-60s when he said he was giving up painting and, and it just didn't make sense that he would give up painting when he became so successful. But then he was doing films, and there again, I don't think anybody understood the films because they were kind of artsy, strange films. New York was going, and not only New York, but also the, the, the West Coast, uh, San Francisco. There were new movements in cinema to, to expand the forms of cinema from just narrative, storytelling, Hollywood kind of public cinema into poetic forms of cinema and abstract forms of cinema. Jonas Minkus, a pioneer of experimental cinema, ran the only New York cinema showing underground films. The first series of films that Andy brought to me were a, a series of uh, kisses. He decided to project it, not a normal speed, but slowed down. That was a genius stroke, really. If you project it 24 frames per second, it's a little bit boring, naturalistic. Uh, but when you slow it down, you, it becomes like super reality. A little bit of a dream is brought in on reality. What was in the air at that time in all of the arts was like art uh, in time. But he brought it to cinema. Main contribution was to go back to the origins of cinema and to reinvent it. He was the Lumiere of, uh, of the 60s. Using primitive filmmaking techniques with no editing, Warhol observed day-to-day -day life. His films are like pictures, barely moving. His filmmaking was a continuation of his painting. At that time, Agnès Varda, the director of Cléo de saint Cassette, was also working on temporality in films. She was in New York, and she had come to the factory because she had plans to work with one of Warhol's superstars, Viva. Nous, la petite nouvelle vague, quand on arrivait en Amérique, on était connus comme tels. We were the little new wave. When we came to America, that's what we were known as. Andy was pleased to see us. He gave me a warm welcome and spoke about this and that. I told him I wanted to meet Viva with a view to making a film with her. Viva, you must work with her. She made a wonderful film, Cleo from 5 to 7. If I had made it, I would have shot from 5 to 7. He would have made it in two hours. It took me two months. I loved that. Coming from France, we stuck to traditions and did things by the rule book, especially in the 60s. 
They were all moving away from traditional perceptions, and Warhol was a wonderful pioneer for that. His most radical film was Empire. It was a static shot of the Empire State Building, shot in July 1964. Screened in slow motion, the film lasted eight hours with no shot changes. People really hated his movies, the early movies. When we showed Empire in the movie theater, people were throwing things at the screen. And Andy was getting worried because we were standing in the back of the theater. He said to me, do you think they really hate it? Oh, yeah, I think they do. <laughs> he revolutionized filmmaking simply by taking on the issue of time and continuity. I mean, it's important that someone did that. It doesn't mean people are going to rush to see his films at the cinema, but his films marked a turning point for me in the history of filmmaking. We didn't look at time in the same way after that. I think there was filmmaking before Andy Warhol and filmmaking after him. Andy Warhol shot nearly 60 films over five years, experimenting with filmmaking on the same industrial scale that he made paintings. He dreamt of running his own avant-garde studios and wanted to see his name associated with a rock band. In 1965, he went with Gerard Malanga to a concert at Café Bazaar. Velvet Underground were playing. So we actually went down to see them perform, and this was a matinee, like, I don't know, 3 o'clock in the afternoon in this cafe in Greenwich Village. There was no stage, it was just the same floor, and there were tables with young kids at the different tables. It wasn't a, an auditorium or anything. And um, I just happened to have a whip with me as a fashion accoutrement, just to tie it up my belt. And um, at some point, I took the whip off my belt, and I started dancing with the whip while they're performing. Well, within five minutes, everybody at the tables got up off the chairs, and they started dancing, too. No one was dancing at the beginning. Warhol was instantly seduced by their raw and poetic style. It was a sort of erotic wild lament with crude lyrics. Warhol offered Velvet the use of the factory to rehearse in. Nobody took it seriously. Nobody felt at that time that it would be that important. Actually, we thought that uh, Nico, he, she was just a very bad singer. And <laughs> Uh, it was just part of that of life. Lou Reed, when he and Andy kind of connected, I think that uh, something special happened. They were both breaking new ground, and I think that uh, it was an exciting period to be there in New York uh, doing what they were doing. That was part of my uncle's concept of, of bringing it all together in, in one big um, uh, kind of uh, artistic performance. Velvet became part of the factory, giving it a new, more rock and underground identity. Punk before its time. It was a hysterical time, with more and more people turning up at the factory. In 1968, the spirit of provocation and impertinence gained momentum. It was a violent and worrying time in the history of America. CBS News in New York with a special report on Martin Luther King, The Aftermath. The assassination of Martin Luther King triggered riots in most of the big cities. The Negro community is clearly angry, often uncontrollably angry. In the spring, the building housing the silver factory was to be demolished. They had to move out. Warhol found the ideal place in this building in the south of Manhattan a new factory which was to be the scene of a tragic episode. One of the weird and wonderful people hanging out at the factory was Valerie Solanas. She was openly gay and had just published The Scum Manifesto, a radical feminist pamphlet. That Valerie was crazy. She belonged to a group called SCUM, Society for Cutting Up Men. One day, Valerie Solanas offered Andy a film script. 
The title was Up Your Ass. He wasn't interested, and after a while, he announced to her that he had lost the script. On the afternoon of the 3rd of June, 1968, Valerie Solanas showed up at the new factory again. She was waiting in the lobby, and they actually rode the elevator up together. And, and he had a phone conversation with Viva, and I guess she was at, at the beauty salon having her hair done. Solanas pulled out her, her gun and shot him while he was on the phone. Warhol was crouched over like this when the bullet hit him, and so it, it came through the side like this instead of this way, and it passed through like something like five or six or seven organs. It took a while for the ambulance to come. When he got to the hospital, he was very near death. He had lost a lot of blood. They operated for about five and a half hours. He, after the surgery, he was laying in his hospital room, and he thought that he had died because he could hear on the television that Kennedy had been shot. Young Robert Kennedy first won fame. He thought that that's what happened when you die. You just relive history. And uh, he had no idea that, that it was Robert Kennedy who had been shot. This, this is what he claimed, anyway. My uh, oldest brother, Paul, was studying to be a priest. He stayed with my uncle for a few months. Uh, during that summer, it was a really uh, traumatic experience uh, for everybody and for especially my uncle because uh, it took him many months to recover from that. He was discharged after two months of convalescence. He'd come through it, but he was very weak. He said, I'm a survivor. He said he felt as if he were living in another world, a much more uncertain world. He said he thought he was only afraid of God, but that had all changed now. That photograph is incredible. It's a record of what he went through. It also shows his ability to rise above it. Those are the stigmata of a man who almost died. They are proof of what he endured and of his resurrection. It was a big turning point for his career. I think his work had changed. I think his personality changed a little. I think it was just a natural way, a way of him shifting and being more careful. Uh, but creatively, it was definitely, a, a, I think, a step down. In the years that followed, Andy Warhol was fearful, and his fear was deep-rooted. He was so traumatized, he made a clean sweep. His former associates left the factory. No more superstars, no more marginals. By giving up this community, which had inspired him for all those years, he lost his creativity. For him, the 70s were empty years. Perhaps that's what his work was dealing with in the 70s, emptiness. In May 1969, Esquire's cover featured Andy Warhol drowning in a tin of Campbell's soup. The headline was unambiguous, the final decline and total collapse of the American avant-garde. In 1970, Andy Warhol carried on creating a void around him and sent his mother to Pittsburgh to live with his brothers. Julia died on the 22nd of November, 1972. As with 30 years previously on the death of his father, Andy didn't go to the funeral and didn't speak to anyone about his mother's death. A new factory was born out of his fears, the office. Now neurotically obsessed with death, he sought refuge in the practice of compulsively recording everything. His tape recorder and Polaroid camera never left his side. He changed, hiding behind his viewfinder as a way of seeing without being seen, of being present but not really there. He blurred the high and low line. Uh, he was constantly criticized by the New York art establishment for be going out too much. His way of working was to be out in the world. To he was tape recording everybody. He was, I videotaped all the time. He was taking Polaroids of people. 
do documentation of his time and was part of his art and what he wanted to do. Andy Warhol changed worlds and environments. He was gradually moving into the world of money. This was something quite different. These were businessmen. They carried briefcases. He was no longer directing films. He was interviewing people and making television programs. There was a complete change. 1971 is the beginning of really of doing portraits. Fred Hughes is a business manager and, and close confidant, and Bruno Bischofberger, his Swiss dealer, really developed this idea of doing portrait commissions, which was a way of making money. And Andy understood the art historical importance of that because in the history of art, the, the courts of Europe always had portraits commissioned of the wealthy people of the time, the lords. And During the 70s, Warhol sold his talent. Mick Jagger, John Lennon, Grace Jones, and numerous other stars commissioned portraits. He produced between 50 and 100 of them a year for astronomical sums. This work was neither personal nor political. He just churned them out. These portraits came to overshadow his return to darker and more intimate work. In 1976, Warhol made Skulls, a screen-printed series of 60 skulls. As if returning from the dead, he seemed to drop his mask and confront his audience head-on, revealing his mystical obsessions for the first time. In 1978, he produced the mysterious Shadows. These abstract shadows were reproduced ad infinitum, they gave us a glimpse of his obscure, hallucinatory dreams. There is a possibility that he was becoming more spiritual in his work and a little more introverted, like the abstract paintings. The shadow paintings really made the art critics stop in their tracks because they couldn't, they didn't know what to make of it. They are so spiritual, so beautiful and ethereal. Warhol's late works are just as extraordinary as his early works. They are prodigious, what with the shadows, the camouflages, the diamonds, and the piss paintings. They are just as interesting as his early works, like an apple tree blossoming before it dies. Andy Warhol seemed to sense the arrival of his own death. His works are now openly religious. His final work in 1987 was a variation on Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. He painted The Last Supper in 1986, shortly before his death. Most Carpathian Rusins in their living room or kitchen, wherever they ate, they would have that some sort of picture, a resemblance of The Last Supper to remind them of that very important event. That was a part of his life that he didn't talk much about. But I believe at that point in his life, he really needed to get it out. It was his way of communicating. It wasn't like he was going to stand on top of a a soapbox and say, hey, I'm religious. That was his quiet way of saying, look, I am very religious and this is important to me and I'm going to paint something that's very close to my heart. That's the advantage of success. It liberates you from a number of constraints. He exploited that success to do something he had wanted to do for a long time. He could now pick up the Christian theme again and use it as a subject matter for his paintings. He made explicit what was implicit in a number of his paintings from the 60s. On the 22nd of February 1987, Andy Warhol died, aged 58, of a heart attack following a routine gallbladder operation. In New York, 2,000 people attended a mass to pay tribute to him. The speeches made by the artist's nearest and dearest gave the public a glimpse of just how religious he had been. 
But we didn't learn until after his death he would go to a homeless shelter in New York and hang out with the homeless the whole day. And he didn't even tell us. And it's probably not the image that most people think of, of Andy Warhol, but I mean, all the other stuff is there. You know, this is just another side that makes him that much more, you know, intriguing and, and special. But we never talked about personal things very much. Andy didn't like to touch upon those things. I knew he was going to church, because if you picked him up on a Sunday from his home, he stopped at the, the church nearby. Go in, and I would wait outside. He'd go in for a few minutes and come back out. He didn't. He didn't talk about these. This is all private. I kind of miss this uh, this personal contact that I had with him, and he was always interested in what I was doing, and he'd tell me something new that he was doing. Um, and uh, you know, he was always Uncle Andy to us. So uh, um, 